Welcome to the most horrible history lesson ever, or should that be the best ever? Bits of history that your teachers could never tell you, with all the gory bits left in. <coughs> Kellogg's has teamed up with Horrible Histories, and with the writer Terry Deary, uh, that's me, <coughs> to bring you a series of disgusting tales from some of the most famous periods in history. Some of them are so foul, you may even have to hold your nose and close your eyes as you listen to them. This is one of six CDs in the series, available free on special packs of cornflakes, frosties, cocoa pops and rice krispies. Each 30-minute CD is exclusive to Kellogg's, so you'll be one of the few people to know about some of the darkest secrets from the days of old. You may just want to eat your breakfast before pinning back your ears. Enjoy! Hello, I'm Terry Deary, author of the Horrible Histories books, and I'm here to tell you about a period of history that was truly horrible, the age of Queen Victoria and her vile Victorian people. Because history can be horrible. People in the past did dreadful things to one another. They still do, but in the past it was more personal. They put their greedy, grubby hands on you and grabbed what they wanted. They didn't care how much they hurt you. So the victims looked to the law to protect them, and by the 1800s, the laws had become more cruel than the crimes. I mean, if you were caught chopping down someone else's tree, you could be hanged. What sort of policeman would arrest you for chopping down a tree? Special branch, I suppose. <laughs> the laws became so cruel, you could feel just as sorry for the villains as the victims. The prisons were full of poor people who pinched pennies by picking pockets. Posh people didn't have to mug and murder to make money. They owned the filthy factories and the murky mines where the poor slaved and suffered. Many mine owners didn't mind how many died in their damp and gas-filled pits as long as they made lots of money. So, in the dark days of Queen Victoria, who were the real villains? The poor pilfering people of the slums? or the mean, miserly men in their massive mansions? And how would you have got on in those terrible times? What you need is a history that tells you about those vile and villainous Victorians. Now, where will you find a history like that? As it happens, you are listening to it! When Victoria was Queen, the poor workers of Britain were crowding into dark, damp and filthy, dirty little houses. Well, the houses were handy for the foul factories that belched out the choking smoke. The factories that paid them a pitiful wage. So the workers suffered the slums. But one class of people liked the dingy streets and the black back lanes. The criminals. The slums were home to whizzers, van draggers, screws. You don't know what they did? Oh, very well, I'll tell you. Wizards were pickpockets. Van draggers stole from the backs of horse-drawn vans. Screws burgled houses. The really villainous ones carried squirters. No, 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 not water pistols, you dummy. Real pistols. And these wizards with squirters were not afraid of bogies, neither. <coughs> a, a bogey was a policeman. Now here's a word you really needed to know if you're going to survive in Victoria's England, garrotter. In the 1850s and 1860s, a new terror hit the city streets, garrotting. A Victorian villain explained what garrotting was and some of the secret language of the criminals. I'm a Toby, you see, a Toby, a street robber. First, I pick my victim. Someone with lots of drops in his pit, um, that is, lots of money in his wallet. And a nice kettle and tackle, of course, uh, that is to say, watch and chain. Of course, they won't end it over without a fight. So, what do I do? That's when I go rots them. I grab them by the neck, and then I, 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 I do a secret move known only to us ca Well, I can't even tell you who it's known to. That's a secret, too. If I told you, I would have to garrot you. <laughs> By 1863, there were 115 garrotting cases in London and other cities were starting to copy. 
What did half of those men do when they weren't robbing people in the alleys? Were they teachers? No. Were they policemen? No. Were they cab drivers? No. I mean, yes, they were cab drivers. They rode in horse-drawn taxis. Sort of, first they taxis you, then they attaxis you. Oh. <clears throat> a newspaper reported, London is a battlefield of raging cabmen. <coughs> of course, there were always honest people who will make money out of your fears. In the 1860s, a new type of men's clothing appeared. Scared of garrotters? Protect yourself with our wonderful new leather collar. Wear this tough leather collar round your neck and feel safe. No garrotter can harm you while you wear this wonderful invention. Smart and comfortable too. Only two shillings each. Of course, the villainous Victorians couldn't be allowed to get away with their vicious crimes. When they were caught, they were punished, and I mean punished. Ask yourself this. Would you nab a kettle and tackle if you could be whipped for it? <laughs> Not only did they beat you, they even wrote a report on the beating. Here's an actual report from Leeds Jail. Date, 3rd of January, 1867. Prisoner... Thomas Beaumont, aged 47. Crime, garrotting and robbing Abraham Dickinson of Batley near Dewsbury. Sentence, five years in prison. Punishment, 24 lashes. Report. The criminal was first strapped to a triangle of wood. The officer used a new cat and nine tails whip, a whip with nine strands and three hard knots at the end of each strand. Beaumont took the first stroke in silence. After the second, he cried out in pain, and after the third, he cried, Oh dear me! As the blows followed quickly, his cries grew louder. After twelve strokes, his back began to show marks from the lashing. By the end of the lashing, he was screaming for mercy. And you thought detention was bad? If the Victorians had a favourite subject, then it was death. They liked nothing better than the story of suffering, heartbreak, tragedy and cruelty. The trouble is, it's not just the subjects that were painful. The writing was pretty bad too. The Victorian ballad writers were probably the world's worst poets. They had no television or radio or CDs. How did they entertain themselves at home? The middle classes would buy a piano, learn to play it and sing songs. But some of them were hardly cheerful. Take a song like, That Is Love. The words go like this. See the father standing at his cottage door, watching the baby in the gutter rolling o'er. Laughing at his merry pranks, but hark a roar. Help, oh, helping gracious heavens above. Dashing down the road, there comes a maddened horse. Out the father rushes with resistless force. Saves the child, but lies there, a mangled corpse. That is love. That is love. It is also a squidgy mess in the middle of the road. Of course, orphans were always good for a tearful story. Little children who have lost their mothers and have been told they've gone to heaven. That's the story behind the dreadful, Shall I be an angel, Daddy? One day a father to his little son told a sad story, a heartbreaking one. He took from an album a photo and said, This is your mother, but she's been long dead. You she has left me to cherish and love. She is an angel, my child, up above. The boy, in an instant, drew close to his side, and these are the words that he softly replied. Shall I be an angel, Daddy, an angel in the sky? Will I wear the golden wings and rest in peace on high? Shall I live forever and ever with the angels fair? If I go to heaven, oh, tell me, Daddy, Will I see Mother 
there? <laughs> but the worst poet ever was the Scotsman William McGonagall. Most students of English agree that the Scottish poet William McGonagall was probably the worst poet ever to publish in the English language. It wasn't just the way he mangled words. It was the awful subjects he wrote about. McGonagall told the stories of real tragedy. The title of this one is Truly Sad, Calamity in London, Family of Ten Burned to Death. But the poem is truly, hilariously bad. Oh, heaven, it was a frightful and pitiful sight to see. Seven bodies charred of the Jarvis family. And a Mrs. Jarvis found with her child and both carbonized. And as the searchers gazed thereon, they were surprised. And these were lying beside the fragments of the bed. And in the chair, the tenth victim was sitting dead. Oh, horrible! Oh, horrible! What a sight to behold! The charred and burnt bodies of young and old. Frightful, pitiful, and horrible. And that's just McGonagall's poetry. But his most famous was the Tay Bridge disaster. In December 1879, a train was crossing the Tay Bridge in a storm when the bridge collapsed. 79 passengers were catapulted into the dark, icy waters of the Tay below. The only survivor was McGonagall's dreadful poem about the affair. Beautiful railway bridge on the silvery Tay. Alas, I am very sorry to say that 90 lives have been taken away on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. So the train moved slowly along the bridge of Tay until it was about midway. Then the central girders with a clack gave way and down went the train and passengers into the Tay. It must have been an awful sight to witness in the dusky moonlight. I must now conclude my lay by telling the world fiercely without the least dismay. For the stronger we our bridges do build, the less chance we have of being killed on the last Sabbath day of 1879, which will be remembered for a very long time. Do you ever get fed up with being treated like a kid? Want to be treated like a grown-up? Not if you were a Victorian kid, you wouldn't. Because Victorian children could be punished like adults. One boy told this story to a newspaper after he'd been arrested. I was born near Cambridge. My mother died when I was five and my father married again. My stepmother hated me, so I ran away. I lived by begging and sleeping rough and made my way to London. There I'd sleep on the doorsteps or anywhere to give me a little shelter. I suffered terribly from hunger and at times I thought I'd starve. I got crusts, but I can hardly tell how I lived. One night I was sleeping under a railway bridge when a policeman come along and asked me what I was up to. I told him I had no place to go and he said I had to go with him. Next morning he took me to the court and told the judge there were always a lot of boys living under the bridge. They were young thieves and they gave a lot of trouble. I was mixing with them so I was given 14 days in prison. I'd carry on begging and go from workhouse to workhouse to sleep. I'm unhappy, but I have to get used to it. If you were like that boy, you may have wanted to make some dishonest money. Of course you don't, but if you did... Alright, ladies and gentlemen, here for your entertainment and instruction are a few tips and tricks for you little beggars. First, let me present the Shivering Dodge. On a cold morning, Dress in your thinnest clothes and stand on the street corner. Start shivering and pull the 
pleading for money to buy a warm coat. And top tip, take a warm handkerchief and cough into it as if you're ill. <laughs> the Shivering Dodge was a favourite of Shaking Jemmy. He went on shivering so long he couldn't stop himself, even when he was in a warm house. Uh, thank you. And then we have the Lucifer Dodge. Take a tray full of matches, uh, called Lucifers, to sell on the street. As a rich gent walks past, spill them, as if he's knocked them out of your hand. Scrabble on the ground to pick them up and howl your heart out. <laughs> Top tip, if the gent doesn't give you money, then other people passing by may cough up a coin or two. Top tip number two, get your little friends to gather up the matches and try it again. And again. And again. Next, we have the tea and sugar dodge. Here's what you do. Sit on the curb with two empty packets. Sob the following. Sob. <laughs> me mum sent me for tea and sugar, but a nasty boy emptied them into the gutter. <laughs> have a stooge there who can help you out a bit. They could say, And that was his ma's last shilling. He dared go home. <laughs> Top tip. Scatter a little tea and sugar in the gutter to make the story look good. Now, this dodge has been known to earn up to 18 shillings in one morning when many working men don't make 10 shillings a week. <laughs> and that brings us to the scaldrum dodge. Cover your bare arms and legs with soap. Rub vinegar into the soap. And the mess looks like ugly blisters. Or... Strap a leg up under your jacket to make it look as if you've lost one. Uh, top tip, if the soap on your leg doesn't work, then stick soap in your mouth till you froth and foam. Oh, and top tip two, if looking ill didn't help, then pretend to choke on a piece of dry bread. <coughs> Take money to get ale to wash the dry bread from your throat. If everything else fails, then try this really disgusting one. The bird bread dodge. Find a garden where someone has thrown stale bread out for the birds. Pick it up and begin to eat it. Top tip. It is best if the bread is covered in maggots. Do not shake them off before you eat the bread. After all, they'll make a nice bit of meat in your sandwich. Huh? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, begging was against the law, but it was hard to stay out of trouble because there were some pretty odd laws in Victorian times. Here's a list of crimes. Can you tell which are true and which are false? You have two seconds to answer, true or false. If you get seven or more, you can award yourself a Victorian stamp for your album. If you get less than five, award yourself a Victorian stamp on the toe. <laughs> Here we go. Number one. Racing dogs along the street and betting on the winner was a crime. True or false? That's true. You would be fined one pound. Number two. Being cheeky to a teacher was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number three. Snowballing was a crime. True or false? That's true. You could get a fine. Forgetting to do your homework was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number five. Sliding on an icy pavement was a crime. True or false? That's true. Another fine for you. Number six. Eating a pork pie after 9pm was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number seven. A man dressing in women's clothes was a crime. True or false? That's true. James Wilson was fined 12 pence for this. Number eight. Laughing in school was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number nine. 
shaking a carpet in the street after nine in the morning was a crime. True or false? That's true. Shaking your carpet before 9am was all right, though. Number 10. Putting your tongue out at your dad was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number 11. Dumping your dead cat in the road was a crime. True or false? That's true. Dumping dead animals or rotten meat could cost you a £5 fine. Number 12. Coughing in church was a crime. True or false? That's false. Number 13. Throwing orange peel on the pavement was a crime. True or false? That's true. Dropping orange peel cost one young man a 12p fine in 1873. So, how did you score? Are you a... Or are you a... The Victorian age was the time when the British travelled around the world looking for countries to conquer. When they'd smashed the natives, then they made their country part of Queen Victoria's British Empire. The Victorians loved to hear tales of their unbeatable heroes in distant corners of the earth. Even common, dirty little Brit soldiers didn't give in. Private John Moyes, who came from Scotland, joined a Brit regiment called the Buffs. In the China War of 1860, a Chinese lord captured Moyes and told him to kneel. Moyes said, not even a poor Brit like me will bow to a posh Chinese lord like you. The lord had Moyes' cheeky Scottish head lopped off. Moyes became famous when Sir Francis Hastings Doyle wrote a poem about him, The Private of the Buffs. A bus with eyes that would not shrink, with knee to man unbent, unfaltering on its dreadful brink, to his red grave he went. The poem should have been about using your head, not losing your head. I'd have written it something like this. The Private of the Biffs. Last night he was a soldier brave, a private in the Biffs. Today he's lying in his grave. He's just another stiff in two pieces. He stood before the Chinese Lord and showed no sign of fears. A British heartbeat in his chest, but no brain between his ears. Or anywhere else for that matter. Just kneel down there, the Chinese said. Kneel down, I'll spare your neck. I won't, cos I'm a battling Brit. I won't, I say, by heck. Oops. The Chinese Lord, he shrugged and sighed. You are a brain-dead Biff. You'll make me lop your silly head. The Lord you know was miffed and put out. So private boys, they took him out and made him dig a pit. They melt him down and chopped his head. The head fell straight in it. And the body followed. Thump. The sword was quick, so private boys, no pain in his neck felt. The Chinese lordy laughed and said, to get the chop, he melt. So I won. Moyes lost his head, his grave was red, and don't you feel like blubbing? He didn't die for Britain's Queen. He died because he was stubborn as a mule. One of Victoria's empire builders in Africa was Lord Robert Baden-Powell. If you think you've heard that name before, then you may be a Boy Scout, because Lord Bob invented the Boy Scouts. That was one of his nicer hobbies. One of his horribly historical hobbies was hunting for wild boars with spears. It was known as pig sticking. He described it in one of his books. The boar is brave and tough, as fast as a horse, and it can jump where a horse cannot. He doesn't hesitate to swim a river, even when it's inhabited by crocodiles. Three or four riders form a party. Beaters drive the pig out of his lair in the jungle and the party then race after him. But for the first three quarters of a mile he can generally outrun them. A spear thrust, unless delivered in a vital spot, has little effect beyond making him more angry. And then follows a good deal of charging on both sides. And it is not always the boar that comes off second best. He has a wonderful power of quick and effective use of his tusks. 
and many a good horse has been fatally gashed by the animal he was hunting. Hang on, Lord Baking Powder. The poor horse wasn't hunting the boar. You were. Chief Scout Robert obviously had some funny ideas about sport. Look at his idea of killing a hyena. I also had a ride after a hyena with a number of Arabs. One of the most alarming games I ever took part in. For the plan was to gallop him down and surround him and for every man then to loose off his rifle at him. A gang of men shooting at an exhausted hyena. Call that sport? That's what the posh people did. But what about the poor? What did the poor people do for fun? They killed rats instead. A Victorian writer described a visit to a rat pit. Oh, fifteen rats were flung into the pit and they gathered themselves into a mound. They were all sewer rats and the smell that rose from them was like that from a hot drain. Then a terrier dog was dropped in and he buried his nose in the mound till he brought one out with his mouth. In a short time, a dozen rats were lying bleeding on the floor, and the white paint of the pit was stained with blood. In a little time, the terrier had a rat hanging onto his nose, which despite its tossing still held on. He dashed it against the sides of the pit, leaving a patch of red as if a strawberry had been smashed there. Time, called the owner. The dog was caught and held, and the dead ones counted to see who had won the bet. Then the lad with the rats called, Would any gentleman like any rats? So, which vile Victorian sport would you fancy? Pig sticking or rat hunting? Hard choice, isn't it? Of course... Down here in these lovely but rather smelly tunnels, the Victorians helped encourage a new kind of rat. Get off, you rat! Only the very rich had proper toilets with water to flush away the contents into these brick sewers. The poor, even at night, had to creep to a small building at the bottom of the yard. There was a wooden bench with a hole in it. Underneath were ashes from the fire. Once a week, the ashes would be collected by workers called Night Soil Men and taken away in a cart to be dumped. The rich Victorians didn't have Night Soil Men. No, they had flushing water toilets and those lovely new sewers. And those sewers went straight from their houses down to the river. And they didn't care what things they dug up to lay down those drains. Things like dead bodies. Yep, they dug through the poor graveyards. They moved the bodies, dug them up and moved them. And that upset the relatives. It may even have upset the ghosts. The vile Victorians even had a song about it. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I would like to perform that tragic song, They're Moving Father's Grave to Build a Sewer. You all know it. Feel free to join in. They're moving father's grave to build a sewer. They're shifting it regardless of expense. They're moving his remains to put in nine inch drains to irrigate some posh folks' residence. Now what's the use of having a religion? And thinking when you die, your troubles cease. If some society chap wants a pipeline for his tank, and they shift you from your place of rest and peace. But in his life, our daddy, he weren't a quitter. And I don't suppose he'll be a quitter now. So he'll haunt their toilet seats in his funeral sheets. And they'll only get to piddle when he'll allow. Then won't there be some ruddy consternation? And won't those city chaps all rent and rave? Which is no more than they deserve. For having a ruddy nerve 
to muck about with a British workman's grave. Workman's grave. And there you have it. A horrible tale from the death-loving, rat-infested, sewer-smelling, slum-dwelling Victorians. Victorian Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli said Victoria did not rule over one nation, he ruled over two nations. Two groups of people who didn't understand how the other one lived, or thought, or felt. Two nations who ate different food, had different ways of life, and even different laws. Two nations who might have been from different planets. As Disraeli said, two nations, the rich and the poor. Many of the poor were villainous. They had to be to stay alive. They robbed and rioted, grabbed and garroted, stabbed and stole in the world of hangings and hatred, and disease and easy death. That's what I call horrible history. Get off, you rat! We hope you enjoyed learning about the despicable goings-on of our ancestors as much as we did when we made these CDs. Don't forget to watch out for other CD audiobooks on special packs of Kellogg cereals. You can learn about... The Terrible Tudors. The Rotten Romans. The Measly Middle Ages. Incredible Ireland. And the Vicious Vikings. Look for the whole horrible lot. Histories are written and read by Terry Deary and produced by Nick Baker for Testbed Productions. Original music is by Danny Fromaggio, sound design by Dirk Mags. Horrible histories are published by Scholastic Children's Books. And they're really horrible. <coughs> <coughs>